speaker is Brett Nealon. Um, Professor Brett Nealon is head of the School of Environmental and Life Sciences at the University of Newcastle. He's an expert in molecular microbiology, genetic and genomic engineering, and microbial chemistry, and has published extensively on the genetics and biosynthesis of toxins of by cyanobacteria. So welcome, and we look forward to what Um, so this, I want to go through, uh, I think a really interesting project that's been neglected for a long time in cyanobacterial research in Australia. And Australia is one of the countries that really started a lot of cyanobacterial research way back in the early 90s when we had a big problem in the uh, Dar uh, Darling uh, Barwon um, River with anabina, toxic anabina producing saxing toxin. What has been totally neglected is the input of the benthos as a seeding environment for the blooms that we see on the surface. So we formulated this project and it's about to be submitted as a linkage grant hopefully in the next two weeks. It's been, we've been working on it for about a year. Um, and the main players are Aaron who's here, Nick and Caitlin who is a Water Research Australia PhD student. So we're going to focus on Microcystis originosa because in the Western Treatment Plant uh, ponds, we, we, we figure this is the main uh, nuisance or harmful algae that we, we're going to be targeting. Um, but as Nick said, there's plenty of other species present. The reason I'm part of this group, I guess, is because uh, historically we've been studying uh, Michael Schitt, sorry. That's <laughs> your language. Oh, it's all right. I mean, I'm not uni anymore. Yeah, that's right. The, is there a pointer? <laughs> this, this, uh, now the lecturer steps in, right? This is microsystem. It's, no, it's, it's a cyclic peptide. We discovered the genes that create this molecule. So essentially, I'm coming from the point of view of being a geneticist, a molecular biologist, understanding why these uh, toxic compounds are made. The importance of this project, I think, is understanding why they make the toxins and do these toxins, are these toxins also present in the benthos, as we know they are in the planktic um, environment. Cyanobacteria, all cyanobacteria have these wonderful physiologies that they've developed over three billion years on Earth and issues about phosphate, meta phosphate and nitrogen metabolism, their dormancy, which is really the focus of this project, how they survive over winter and all of a sudden uh, pop up in the summer. It's not creationism, that they, they have to come from somewhere. Um, so the physiology in this benthos is really something that's never been studied before uh, globally. So this, this really puts our project here with Melbourne Water on the historical map. So there's, there's many different toxins that can be produced by different species, and there's different isoforms of those toxins. We want to understand what selects for the different toxins, the different isoforms, because they all have different toxicities to humans and birds. So what happens is we might study it here in WTP, but there's all different issues related to what species are selected and then what toxin in those species is being produced. As you'll see in our long-term plan, we want to overlay the data that we generate from W2P across many different water environments in Australia and, and the world. So the crux of this project is that this is typically what's in winter, or we're predicting what's happening in winter. And w, w, W2P, I should say, is a classic environment for this study because the, the only input is sewage. Am I correct? There's like when we're talking, we've done lots of work in rivers, and this question is very hard to answer in rivers because you're going to have input of toxic cyan or cyanobacteria flowing in from tributaries into a river and then into a reservoir. We've done lots of work there, but we can't answer the question in a reservoir where the toxic cyanobacteria come from. It is either coming in from the tributaries or it's actually in the benthos, deep in the benthos of these reservoirs which a lot of people would say couldn't be possible because they're too deep at the dam wall, for instance. So again, WTP is a classic model for this type of study. So this is the, the overall aim or the overall goal, goal of our linkage project that we've um, formulated. 
So we want to study the biota, so the algae, the, the cyanobacteria, and the metadata or the abiotic factors that go along with what happens when a bloom is formed or not, and whether that bloom is toxic or not. As I said, we want to understand dormancy, and this really comes, this plays with the climate change issue that Fiona will talk about later, is with climate change, will we see less dormancy? Will we see less of this, what we call, wintering event? The stability of the population that's present, because we're using genetic tools here, we call it genetic stability, and what conditions, what environmental conditions lead to that becoming a plankton uh, blue. So Nick's already showed you this. This is the site we're using. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but this is the, is it Eastern? It's uh, 25 Western. Western? <laughs> I'm going to get something. 55 Western. And with this, the main study is in it's one of that area. Sites, yeah. So we've done some initial work, and I just want to point out here, when we look at microcystis in the purple light, it is the most variable population that we see. And this is happening not just, not just over winters, but even in uh, the summer months. So we get this very variability in the population present. I'll go back to an example in Warwick Amber Dam in Sydney, where we did a similar study using uh, quantitative PCR to look at the genotypes present in the water. And whereas you might get a whole population of, of, of microcystis, at a certain time of year, you'll get a spike in a toxic uh, subspecies, a strain. And this is something you won't pick up with microscopy because they all look the same under the microscope. But by using genetics, we picked up that the bloom in these November months uh, were not toxic and therefore didn't need extra filtration treatment um, by the uh, water managers. But all of a sudden, you get a spike in a toxic population, and hence the water becoming not potable. So the first aim, we have three aims in this project. The first aim is to characterize the population that's already in the WTP. And again, Nick's, Nick's has some data, um, and that's uh, mi microscopic evidence. But obviously, there's other things there that we need to characterize. So we're going to do genotyping of the benthic population and the planktic population. We'll do toxin analysis and that's chemical and we'll use methods with Aaron here at um, Wehi. We'll do a metagenomic analysis and that will tell us basically the whole bacterial or algal population that's present in those two environments, the planktic and the benthic. We'll then understand the community structure over different times of the year, actually over two years. So you can see under different conditions, under different conditions of nitrogen and phosphorus, you do get different types of strains being present. And um, these, these different strains also have different levels of toxicity. For example, if you look at microcystin production, which is the toxin from microcystis, high nitrogen, high phosphorus and low iron, all lead to increased production of toxin. And that could either be that the genes are switching on, their toxin genes, or different species are being present, so the genetic stability of the population could change based on the available nutrients. Aim two is to then look at the, the genetic regulation. So the population is, is, a, is a, the genotype, and now we're looking at the phenotype. So what genes are expressed, and therefore um, we're going to use transcriptomics, which is looking at the RNA, so the DNA, and the, and the proteomes which are looking at the, the enzymes that produce the toxins. So this is more the functional analysis of what's happening in the water and the benthos. Uh, for example, the transcription or the RNA increases in high light or red light, which you get, so this is a, another depth issue, so the WTP is a, another a shallow water body that I think Will will talk about a bit later as well. And the starvation of iron. These factors will feed into uh, aim three, which are uh, what, with what model do we use to uh, predict blooms and predict the toxicity of blooms. So that's the abiotic factors, the levels of nutrients present. This will all feed into a predictive computational model, which will be mostly done here in Melbourne Water at the latter stages of the project. Aaron produced this wonderful diagram that's going in the grants. Confusing to me, but you understand what it is. <laughs> And the reviewers of the grant are obviously more intelligent than I am anyway. So last two slides, 
we do that we've done we formulated this project with short-term and long-term goals so in the short term we want to understand what is there and how can we get genetic markers to tell us or to monitor that water over time over, over monthly um, uh, sampling periods we use the genomics approach to find out what is the difference between what's in the benthos and what's in the planktic uh, population in the midterm we will develop a model that's applicable to WTP and in the long term we want to actually extend that model to places, to, to rivers, which I said are very incredibly difficult to monitor right now, but with the model of WTP to start with, we can maybe extend it to rivers and reservoirs. That's it.